a young man in high school at the time who was directly impacted by 9-11, it was easy to instill hate and agenda into my mind. So I was the perfect soldier because I was so blind. What are they gonna think about me? I'm gonna die in a country fighting for something I don't even understand in a country that means nothing for me. Wherever you guys are watching this show, I would truly appreciate it if you follow or subscribe. It helps a lot with the algorithm. It helps us get bigger and better guests, and it helps us grow the team. It truly means a lot. Thank you guys for supporting, and here's the episode. All right, we got Rob Lawrence, my fellow New Jersey buddy here today, fellow veteran. How's it going, brother? I'm good, man. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Absolutely. Uh, it's been a lot going on in the studio today. Yeah, a lot. Had someone just drinking their own piss before you, but uh, we'll see if you could top it. Yeah, I'm uh, still trying to come down from the high of watching a, a stranger <laughs> drink someone else's urine out of a wine glass. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so You've had quite the life, though, man. Um, I know your dad was in the military, right? So you yeah. got raised in that environment. Um, he was in the military uh, when he was younger, and then he got out, and because of his military service, he got the police job mm -hmm. in New York City. Yeah. Which a lot of guys do. Mil a lot of military go into the police. Yeah, I noticed that. Why do you think that is? I think it's just an easy transition. Um the environment is much different, but it's also very similar. Like the team environment, there's a ranking system, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, you're trained as well, so yeah. you're used to being around some hardships. You know. Yeah, you made that transition too, right? You were in the military, then you yeah. became an officer. Yeah, when I first got out of, I was military police. My dad was as well. That's mm -hmm. why I wanted to go into the police force because I was an MP. Right. Just seeing my dad grow up and like going to the softball games with, and people think cops. Like my dad and his crew back in like the late '80s and '90s, like. If there were social media like there is today, these guys would all not have pensions. Like they, they, <laughs> they were more gangster than they were cops uh, in Nor you know North Jersey back in the eighties and nineties. But I grew up around those guys. It was my family, uh, softball games, um, birthdays, barbecues, parties, uh, and I just enjoyed seeing like that camaraderie, and mm. I wanted that. And then nice. obviously nine eleven came, and I'm sure we'll get into that, but. Yeah, I went into the police a few years after I got out of the Army. Wow. Yeah. So do you remember 9-11, like a vivid memory? Yeah, so I was uh, in high school. I was a sophomore. Yeah. And uh, my dad is a uh, retired Port Authority police. Uh, they are like the bridges of the airports, and they do emergency services, hmm. which is kind of like an emergency services truck has a team of almost like what firemen do. So the ESU, Emergency Services Unit, is the guys that have the jaws of life and they'll pull people out of cars and like if there's a guy that's trying to jump off the GW bridge, yeah, they'll, they're the ones that go up and and kick them off the bridge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're the special unit to to go to those type of things. My dad always said, and he and he fully believes this. He always said if his team would have responded to Princess Diana's car crash, yeah, they would have saved her. Really? Yeah. How so? Just the the people that did respond, it took almost an hour for them to get her out of the vehicle. And Jeez. They, he said they would have had her out within minutes and over to triage. Why did it take an hour? Was she stuck? I believe she was in a tunnel. I was young. My dad was a big fan of her and what she was about, yeah. which many people were. Yeah. But she was yeah in the car, and they didn't have the tools. Like I just said, the Jaws of Life is basically a big pliers, and it, it's what can open up and rip doors off. And, yeah. But yeah, I always remember that he said if my if I was if I was in uniform the day Prince Diana got in a car wreck, my guys we would we would have saved her life. Wow, have you ever had to use the jaws of life yourself? No, no, I've seen them uh, be used. Mostly firemen did do that when I was on patrol as an MP, mm -hmm. uh, and with the DoD we didn't carry that type of life saving saving equipment. Um, yeah, but I have seen it uh, in Germany with the Polish eye. I responded to a motorcycle that. Went, you know, those like work trucks, like you see, like a plumber in yeah, or work yeah. vans. Yeah. Yeah. He went th from the passenger side completely through the entire van. And holy crap. Yeah. It was just a complete uh, mess. That's insane. So, what was yeah. it like in Germany? You were there for what, nine years? No, I was there. I got there in August uh, of 2006 after boot camp, mm -hmm. uh, boot camp and AIT. Which is my, you go to boot camp for nine weeks, 10 weeks, and then you go to, I went to military police school, which is your advanced individual training. Mm -hmm. Everybody goes to their MOS, their job specific school. Uh, after MP school, I went back to Jersey for a couple of weeks and like went to the Jersey Shore, thought I was hot. <laughs> you know, I'm the Army soldier now. I yeah. had like three or four grand in the bank. I thought I was a puff daddy. Good old Jersey Shore. Yeah. 
Yeah, we went to Seaside and Belmar and Jenks and all <laughs> so that stuff. So ratchet. <laughs> yeah. Are you looking to start a new website? Look no further than Hostinger. Hostinger is a top global web hosting and website creation brand where you can generate a full website in seconds using their AI website builder. Before it would take hours, sometimes days to start a website. So this is a game changer. All you got to do is answer three questions and it generates an entire website with copy and images. And you can customize it further with a drag and drop editor. No need to pay thousands on web developers anymore. Their builder is also user-friendly, requiring no coding or technical skills, and they offer AI SEO-friendly copy and an AI logo maker to create high-quality logos. They also got a sick AI heat map, which predicts visitor behavior. It's super affordable, guys, less than $3 a month, and that also includes a free domain name, which saves you additional money. If you're interested, check out hostinger.com slash DSH, hostinger.com slash DSH, and use code DSH to get a discount on your order. Back to the show. <laughs> and this was 06, and then I went to Germany. And I was in Germany for 18 months before we deployed to Iraq for 15 months. But it was a really cool 18 months. Being yeah. like, I, I still remember landing in Germany as a young soldier and getting to Frankfurt Airport. And the biggest thing for me was that 90% of the taxis were Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> And all the license plates were super long compared wow. to America. Yeah. And it's nothing now after being there, but yeah, Germany was. So no stress over there, but I'm sure Iraq was a whole different story. Yeah. And originally I was, you see, I, I am the perfect, I was the perfect incubator to instill hate into being that my dad was in 9-11 mm -hmm. and he lost his partner who worked his shift and. 37 guys like on that shirt that I just brought you today, uncles to me, people I looked up to, they died when the towers dropped. So Damn. being a young man in high school at the time who was directly impacted by 9-11, it was easy to instill hate and agenda into my mind. Right. So I was the perfect soldier because I was so blind. So when I did join the military, I, I was all for what I believe the war in Iraq was fighting for democracy and our freedom in America, mm -hmm. which I know now is complete BS. There's a quote from the, the movie uh, 13 Hours in Benghazi. He says, what are they going to think about me? I'm going to die in a country fighting for something I don't even understand in a country that means nothing for me. Mm, damn, that's deep. It's like, But you don't know it in the moment. No, I was just... Uh, when did you come to that realization? Was it after, way after? Way after. Way, I was 20 in Iraq. I'm 37 now. I want to say the clarity came when I got sober five years ago and started to like forgive myself a little bit and, and try to do some self-help and um, not, not hold it all in. Once mm. I started to really seek what's going on inside of me as a war veteran who's dealt with homelessness and addiction and lost custody of kids and been to jail. And I was just in that, 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 that cycle. And I said, I got to really identify why I'm in this position. And that's when I realized like, Oh, I got hate. I got pain. I got all this. And I just started unloading it. Wow. You know? And then I figured like, I love everybody now. So, yeah. so chill, you know, you kept it bottled in for years. It probably just started eating at you physically and mentally. Right. Oh my goodness. So, so many veterans deal with that as well. Like, I didn't know who I was, especially when I got out of the military. Mm -hmm. A lot of soldiers, and, and that's why I'm soon hopefully going to start a community where I can kind of bring vets together, like for like a veteran mastermind type of deal. I'd be sick. Um, because I, no offense to college-educated people, I envy those people. You know, coming <laughs> from Jersey, I had a lot of friends that went and got a degree at Rutgers yeah. or Hofstra, and I was like, man, I wish I had parents that had dinner every night on the table, and I wish my mom wasn't gone, and I could go get a college degree. But I was, like, in an apartment selling <laughs> with Pitbull with a crazy girlfriend, like, waiting to go to boot camp hmm. with all these issues. And I always envied those people. But those are that, that type of person, the, the veteran community needs someone like myself who's been – through the jails, the institutions, the pain, the homelessness, the divorces, the loss of custody, because a college-educated professor who read a bunch of books, which is good, can't tell a vet who drinks himself to death every day and puts a gun in his mouth every night because he doesn't want to live anymore, that they can help him because they don't mm -hmm. understand it. Yeah, the psychology professors you're talking about. Yeah, or or anybody. I feel like let's like you ever like a gynecologist telling a, a like a male gynecologist. I've seen it in person mm -hmm. telling a woman, "You're gonna feel pressure today." It's like, 
how do you know? Yeah. You know, so I think for me, I want to be a pillar to the veteran community and I want to help bridge the gap between like the, the 22 vets a day that are taking their life and the guys that are on the streets homeless and addicted and like figure yeah. out what what it is and take it further than anyone's taken it. Yeah. So when you came back from serving, you you were homeless for a little bit? No, I got I was homeless years later. When I first came back, I went back to Jersey to my dad's. Yeah. Um, he had a big house in Jackson right outside of Freehold. And uh, I was I was with a moving company for a little while and I was trying to find myself again. I was a broker for insurance. Um, and I was just like lost. And I worked at Fort Dix as a contractor. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with some Navy SEALs and Rangers and uh, we did like rotations and got guys like soldiers prepped and ready to go to Afghanistan and Iraq. Mm. They had to come through us for two weeks. Uh, like a boot camp? Yeah, like a, a qualifier. Yeah. So like they, they've already been trained, they come to us and we have to let them utilize their tools and their training proficiently so we can say check you're good you know mm. how to you know how to react to a sniper or react to an id um and i i enjoyed that because i felt like i was back with the guys and i was in uniform but then no i went to texas uh and this whole time i'm i'm falling deeper into addiction mm -hmm. from from pills from the va damn and didn't didn't realize like i was like i'm a i'm an army sergeant I, at the time i was ripped and young and i'm like I'm not like these these guys over here. I'm never gonna get addicted. Like mm. I'm just I enjoy the feeling that I have from a Percocet, and it's got my name on the bottle. I'm not an addict. Mm. Oh damn, I didn't I, I didn't fool anybody at the time <laughs> except for myself. So the addiction led me to be homeless years later when I went through uh, like a psychotic break and ended up uh, being escorted to the VA psych ward for a few days. Damn, um, psych ward. What was that like? Well, it's it's. The one thing that I will say that is very similar to like what you would see in a movie. I watch a lot of war war movies, uh, and it's complete. B right, you know? <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, it seems like a lot of cap in there. It's it's complete BS. Um, but when I went to the the VA psych ward, I was ready at that time. And it may sound a little oh the VA psych. I was ready. Uh, the sheriff that came and and picked me up was a former. Uh, army infantry staff sergeant and he said like are you ready to get help man you're scaring your family um, and i got served divorce papers in solitary confinement after i got told i'm never leaving the jail and i'm gonna lose my kids Jeez. while detoxing off of opiates alone in texas well, that's rock bottom for you right there rock bottom that must have been tough why were you in solitary because i was a former police officer oh so people would come at you yeah wow yeah. eventually i said i'm losing my mind put me in population and uh because of the tattoos and my size i had a no issues. Okay. Um, and you I'm from Jersey. To... Nobody knew. Like, nobody knew who I was. Yeah. But that's the type of story that can inspire a guy who's down and out right now and abusing drugs. I, I fully believe that there's millions of addicts right now that are this close to losing their family, mm -hmm. and they don't even know it. And I've already lost so much. I've lost the custody of my eight-year-old daughter, my boys. Um, even though my life is getting much is, – is much better now, the pain that comes with – losing so much due to addiction mm -hmm. it's it's a lifetime yeah. of pain so i want to help people that are there and don't even notice it yeah you've been through it you can help these guys man yeah, yeah so you can't even talk to your kids no so uh i used to have like supervised visitations rightfully yeah. so at the time um she was scared because i was such a nut i have a big mouth uh, i talk a lot and i said a lot <laughs> of scary things yeah. never physically hurt anybody um but she did the right thing. Yeah. And, and I think any woman who's scared of a man should go and, and seek help, whether it be family, the authorities, whatever. If you feel scared, do not be too scared to go get help. Yeah. And that's coming from a guy who went to jail and lost everything because of my decisions. But no, uh, I lost custody after seven years of fighting. Seven years? Yeah, so from 2016 till a couple months ago, so six years, Jeez. I've been having them held over my head and all the charges are dropped. I have a concealed yeah. carry. I might be a sheriff again. Everything's good. Wow. Build myself back. But she used that against me for all of those years and wouldn't let me see the kids. And like, I just couldn't keep a, I couldn't afford to continue it. So, yeah. So what's your advice for people going through custody stuff right now? Cause seven years, that must've been really stressful. Uh, be respectful. The, the one thing that was on my side was there was over five years of, text messages back and forth with my ex and I. And the attorneys on both of our uh, sides could not find one disrespectful text from me. Wow. 
Yeah. So I, I always be re- present, be respectful. Um, granted, I, I I've said things off camera. I've been very hurt by what what happened, but I take a lot of ownership. That's why I don't have too much hate. If you you can't give people, you can't hate somebody that would never have power to hurt you if you didn't give them the power. Mm. If I didn't do drugs and lead up to the day where I I lost myself, my kids wouldn't have been able to be taken from me. Right. So we have to take complete ownership in our actions. It's the only way that we're going to progress. Mm. I cannot point the finger at anybody but the guy in the mirror. Granted, I shouldn't have had to fight for my daughter for six years living in a camper trailer, going broke, taking loans, everything I can just to be told you can't see her without the justice system doing anything to have the father's back. That's a whole nother story. But as the father and the man, if I didn't get high and give them the power, they wouldn't have any. Yeah. We got to take ownership. That's deep, man, because some people are afraid to, I don't know if it's ego or something. They're They're scared to be honest. I mean, you have the biggest, one of the biggest shows in the world, you know, and uh, that's why I'm being honest on here. Like, there's a... Are you interested in coming on the Digital Social Hour podcast as a guest? We'll click the application link below in the description of this video. We are always looking for cool stories, cool entrepreneurs to talk to about business and life. Click the application link below, and here's the episode, guys. Millions of people like me who went from being on top of the world and fit and like perfect credit and owning a house to like on the streets doing drugs, Mm -hmm. uh, losing themselves and getting in trouble. But what they don't see is the guys that look like me speaking about how they were that guy. Right. You know, they don't see the sober guy that's in Vegas hosting shows and and doing big things, being honest about where he was six years ago. Yeah, people don't want to be vulnerable and admit they had some low points. Everyone has low points. Yeah. They're scared. They're scared of their image. I'm not. My, I'm, I'm scared of not being honest and that if I did not speak about my problems, that I wouldn't save lives. Like, I want to save people's lives. If I could save one veteran's life by sharing my story and showing them, like, it's okay that you can get sober. You can get a new life. Mm-hmm. I did it, bro. Like, yeah. you're not alone. Then I don't care if other people judge me. Like, screw you. If you judge me, then... I don't want to be your friend anyway, you know? Yeah, like, and it's a snowball effect. You save one life, who knows what that guy's going to do with their life. Yeah, that that's the goal. I mean, that's my next big thing, starting the community with veterans and also maybe partnering up with, like, the UFC and maybe, like, the, the A's are coming out here and, mm-hmm. and the hockey teams and um, taking vets to events that, you know, guys that don't even want to make their bed or be alive and then showing them, like, hey, this is my boy Sean Kelly. Mm-hmm. Like, just bringing people around positive people for an event so that they can see a different way of life do you think that's helpful for veterans a lot of them struggle mentally when they get back what do you think the ways to help them are well there's two 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 points to that i think the transition out of the military sucks Mm -hmm. they just throw you back yeah it's called a cap like an acronym for whatever doesn't work you know like they give you like it's like two weeks and you're out of the military you turn in your gear you go get checked by the doctor you sign some Mm -hmm. papers and Nobody gets uh, uh, any service member ready for tr- the transition from like being a squad leader one day to like just Bobby living at your dad's house right. the next day. So you think it should be a longer transition period? Yeah, I think it should be uh, six to eight months. Yeah, like a really and and ensuring that there is support. A lot of guys get out and they they go they don't have a home. A lot of people go in the military because mom and dad work, not the mom and dad that they wanted to be around. You know, right, it, right. it was their safe haven. Um, I've seen guys in jail that were like, I'd rather be in here than out there. At least I'm getting fed and I can get my teeth worked on. Right. So post-military, a lot of people like myself and, and just a lot of people in general, to, in today's age, everyone cares about their image. Mm-hmm. So what comes with that is people lying to not just themselves, but everyone around them about who they are, what they make, and how much stress they have and what's on their shoulders. And that's when that spiral comes and before you know it, you're in a hole and you're on drugs or you're, you're depressed and it's too late to ask for help. Yeah. People need to start saying, brother, I am hurting today. I need your help. And on the other side, people today don't want to help. Everybody's like, I love you, bro. You're my bro. <laughs> and we're cool. Like, oh, yeah, let's take a selfie and do some dope clips. And like, they don't want to answer the phone if you call them on Tuesday. <sighs> Everybody's fake as hell. It's bad. It, it's 
I don't know if it's a West Coast thing or what. <laughs> yeah, we're both from Jersey. Yeah, it's, that didn't happen to me much in Jersey. Ever. Like, ever, yeah. I still have boys that, like, from kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and they're very straightforward, which I like. Yep. But when I moved to L.A., man, god damn, it was tough finding friends out there. How was L.A.? You went there? I went there from Jersey like three years ago, and I moved out in five months. I couldn't take it. Yeah. Vegas is a little better. There's pockets of good people here. Yeah, Vegas is... I, I've never lived in L.A. I lived in the Bay, but I've heard, you know, and I feel like Vegas is my closest experience to, like, that L.A. Everybody here is, like, using... Any, I, I don't know. And we've had these conversations behind closed doors. Like, yeah. it's... In this space, it's... It's unfortunate. I fully believe there's enough to go around for everybody to win. That's how I act too. But yeah, most people don't. They want to step on each other and and clout chase and it's short term thinking. You yeah, know? well I wonder I wonder why. Immediate it, gratification. I don't know. It feels better to win with your friends, win with people. Yeah. Like why would you want to be successful alone? Yeah, that's boring. It's so boring. Imagine going on vacation alone. It's like, why am I <laughs> yeah. even doing that? You know? Yeah, that's such a, that's such a good point. People do it too. I'm like, dude, it's way better with people. Like, I'm going on a cruise. I want all my boys there. Yeah. Well, you the know? other ones who they say the guy that's in Starbucks by himself smiling is a serial killer. So there's no. something like that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's funny, dude. Yeah. So what was tougher? Was prison tougher or being homeless? So. I would have to say being locked up because homeless was self-influenced and, and put on myself. Uh, I always had the option if I decided to go to rehab or get sober that my father would help me. Okay. A lot of people don't have that. Right. But I was just wasn't there. I honestly didn't want to be alive. You, you know Route 9 in Lakewood? Yeah. You know the Walmart? Yeah. I lived in that parking lot. Really? Yeah. So you had a car? I was living in a $42,000 Mustang. And you didn't want to admit to your dad? He knew everything. I was just so gone. Wow. I just didn't. I lost at the, you know, that's that's one thing. When you lose your children and you get divorced and you lose your job and your house and your wife and all, and your life. And the only way to get your kids back is to get sober, but you've lost them through addiction. It's very hard for people to say, "All right, now I'm going to get sober." Because now everything that you cherished and loved has been ripped out of your life mm. and you feel hopeless even more. Right. So now I, for me personally, I went even deeper. And I was like, "Well, now I lost anything that I even wanted to live for so f- it. let's just end it that's and crazy. i just went back to jersey and went to trenton every day and picked up f- and snorted it and hoped i didn't wake up but i kept wow. waking up that's insane so you're here for a reason then yeah i'm here literally i can feel it in my soul 22 vets a day i have it on my my wrist yeah um i have never met anyone that hasn't smiled when they're around me that's awesome and I, and, and I feel like I, it's a gift. I have to save some lives. That's all I want to do. I don't care about the fame. I don't care. Granted, I want to get my community bigger because I can impact more people. Right, right. But I, a lot of people just want all this for the wrong reasons. Terrible reasons, man. Yeah, I'd and rather it, take it longer. Shows. I mean, it shows in their character. Yeah, When absolutely. they're just after money or fame. Like, you could tell. How are you? How did you learn? I don't, I don't ask you questions on your own <laughs> show. But, like, at your age, like... Did you have any like big mentors like coming from someone who's now the newer in the in the social media? Space, I've certainly learned from you in the last couple months. Yeah. Like, how did you get to the, the pinnacle at your age? Like, yeah, I'd say a lot of mentorship. I'd say I'm really quick at learning, and I'd say I'm just like a good person. Not simple as that, dude. Like, I don't try to take advantage of people. So all the energy I'm putting out is good, and it's coming back to me tenfold. You know what I mean? That, yeah, it's I, that, it's that simple. I agree. I do the same. Yeah, yeah. I never walk. I don't have to walk around looking over my shoulder because I'm just no. Why would you want to sleep at night scared? Yeah, like I want to sleep at night knowing I'm doing everything I can. Especially when everything's recorded now. Yeah, your whole life is recorded. These <laughs> yeah, days. you can't. Do they canceled uh, Kevin Hart 13 years later or something, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, he just got canceled. Well, like a couple year ago or so, he was going to do the Oscars. Oh and they yeah. They brought up yeah. a tweet from like 2013 or something. Yeah. But even my old tweets, I mean, I'm sure there's some weird ones, but the lingo changes. You know, growing up in Jersey, we would call people certain names that these days you get canceled for. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. You know how it I is. know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> Jersey was brutal. I miss it. Uh, I'll be there in a few weeks. I'm hoping to go uh, on um, Jay Wow's X. Nice. Uh, I'm friends with uh, Roger Matthews. I'm hoping to go on his podcast and go to the go to the jersey shore and yeah. do all that stuff it's always got a place in my heart i mean it was an interesting time period growing up there what were you like in school were you like top of the top of the pack uh in in the crew i was in yeah. i thought i was 
you know, my ego was huge and I thought I was the, the cool kid. But even then at 16, uh, when 9-11 hit, my dad was engaged to a woman who ended up marrying. So they sold the house I grew up in. Okay. And we moved in with her. But her and I didn't get along. So they got me my own apartment, basically wow, kicked me out. Yeah, so at 16, I was living on my own. Dude, in, in that's Jackson. pretty cool, actually. It was cool, but... Um, you could have parties. I, yeah, but, you know, it got lonely. Right, right. You know, because no you're 16, parents. and there was no... My mom, we didn't really speak. She's in New York, and my dad was sick because of 9-11 on all these pills and, like, drinking himself to death. Yeah. And his wife at the time hated me, so I was like... I had this amazing apartment at the Regency Club off of County Line Road in Jersey, but... uh that's similar to uh, Tony Hawk. Tony Hawk had his own house in high school. Right, yeah. Have a lot of parties. Yeah, um, why didn't you like your dad's girlfriend at the time? I don't think it had anything to do with her. I think it was just me. I had wow. a lot of anger. Interesting. You know, my mom was gone, and I, I, my grandma raised me and with my dad. Pretty strict, you know, uh, Catholic woman from Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to move. I was mad at the world. Like, I didn't understand what just happened to my dad that all his friends just died. Oh, he didn't tell you? I I mean, I, I didn't know at the time, no. I just knew, like, hey, now all of a sudden, because the thing on the TV happened, we have to sell a house that we grew up in. Wow. Like, I uh, resented them. And, Damn. Yeah, I know. I was hurt, so I rebelled. Yeah, because moving as a kid, you got all your friends there. It must have been tough. Yeah, my, I mean, my whole life, 15 years, I lived in that in yeah. that house. And then we're going to some woman's house that I wasn't a huge fan of anyway. Uh what, well, I was lucky, though. I, the first day I lived there before I got kicked out and got an apartment, I went to the school bus stop. Mm -hmm. My friend Dave Gallipoli, he was my best friend growing up. His dad, um, his mother, actually. Jeez. He's probably going to kill me for saying this. But yeah, <laughs> his, dad is, uh, his dad was a correctional officer and his mom like 25 times and Holy went to prison. Holy crap. She survived that? She survived. That's they scary. actually got back together years later. No way. Yeah. Bro. But they couldn't afford the big house that they used to live in. So they bought this tiny little house across the street from the house that I moved into with my dad and his fiance. Wow. So I go to the school bus stop, like at the end of the driveway, and I'm like, is Dave? And he's like, Bobby? And I'm like, what the <laughs> f And yeah, so that helped. So I hung out across the street a lot until I got my apartment. But nice. You still talk to him? Not as much. He's pretty deep in addiction, and I don't really talk to anybody I used with. Oh, sh I have love for everybody, but that's another thing. When when they say people, places, and things, it may say, sound cliche. You have to change if you want to change. Right. You have to leave the environment you're in. You have to change the relationships you have with just not just yourself, but everyone around you. You cannot change your physiology and your mindset and your body and your drug use if you stay in the same exact environment. That's true, and sometimes when you try to help them, it, it drags you back in, right? Yeah, so I just... I have a lot of love for everybody, but like we talked about earlier, everybody kind of came out of the, everyone was like, nobody helped me when I was really down. And now that I'm hosting a show in Vegas and going to UFC events and doing cool stuff, everybody wants to be my friend. They're hitting you up. Yeah. yeah so I went like, through a down moment last year and I really found out my true friends, man. And I can count them on one hand, which is fine. Most people think they have tons of friends, but you won't know until you go through a rock bottom moment who your real friends are. Yeah. I definitely have like five, six. Yeah. But honestly, that's all you need. You don't yeah. need tens of friends i mean i could i have i could have uh, thousands of acquaintances yeah just and, have acquaintances and just be good to everyone you I, only need like a few good people you could talk to yeah yeah uh, happy dad happy dad are you uh up on the all the happy dad stuff with the nelk boys and yeah i'm a fan of them i think what they're teaching about health is powerful you saw kyle's, kyle's transformation ripped. yeah and that's inspiring to kids he's got millions of people following him looking at that yeah kyle's uh He's an interesting gentleman. I'm yeah. proud of them. Uh, I've seen what they've gone from to where they're at now. But Happy Dad, I I I, uh, I love Happy Dad. And yeah. like I said, I'm sober. I don't do drugs or anything. But I don't go to meetings. I don't count days. Um, I'll have a beer once or twice a month or mm. at dinner. But I was with Steve. Will do it. And Steve convinced my dad to drink some Happy Dad at the USC <laughs> VIP. And now my dad loves Happy Dad. <laughs> you know, that was I was with Steve. Uh, Steve will do it the night he got choked out with Steve-O. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, I was cage side. I was gonna leave, and Dude. Steve will do it. It's like, hey, Bobby, don't go. I'm about to get choked out. And uh, <laughs> I went out there, and it was like Steve will do it. Steve-O in the octagon. I saw that. And that was nuts. Yeah, I, don't I know had. If a, I would do that. I had a video of it for days. They were like, Bruh. don't, don't post it. I don't think I could do that. No. No. You think could you? you? I'd rather do that than drink pee. <laughs> <laughs> I think I drink pee, bro. <laughs> Over getting choked out.
But, dude, it's been fun, Rob. Anything you want to close off with or promote? No, I just want to say uh, I'm proud of you. Uh, I've known you a short amount of time, but you do remind me of my friends back home. Uh, you're just who you are, and you, you don't let other things get in your way. And that that should show a lot of people, like, just because you're at a certain level doesn't mean you need to be a d- For sure. Dude. And I think you're teaching people by your actions, you know? Yeah. And I like that a lot. I met Robin Williams, and I guarded him in Iraq with our platoon, and he always said we all put our socks and shoes on the same way. So just always start with love. I love that. He was the most famous person in the world. Yeah, he was a beast. Thanks yeah. for coming on, man. Thanks, bro. Killed it. Thanks for watching, guys, as always, and I'll see you tomorrow.